only six chapters left of Isaiah. I hope we can cover them in the time we have. We're in chapter 61, a passage that we've seen at least part of a number of times because it is explanatory of the whole genre of passages to which it belongs. It is a messianic passage and the reason it's so helpful to us is that Jesus quoted the opening verses of Isaiah 61 and was helpful enough to say these verses, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he identified the fulfillment as already happening in the very act of his preaching. And what he read from the scripture was Isaiah 61, verse 1, and part of verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. At that point, Jesus closed the book. And it was at that point he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What scripture? That Jesus was anointed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. <laughs> now the next part of verse 2 says, and the day of the vengeance of our God. Now Jesus was not there to proclaim that. Not at that point. When Jesus read this scripture, it was at the very beginning of his Galilean ministry in Luke chapter 4. And uh, he was there to proclaim that the kingdom promises were ready to be fulfilled. But he was not there to proclaim that the hour of judgment was now going to be fulfilled, although this did come up later in his later ministry. As he drew near to his crucifixion, more and more of his teaching focused on the judgment that was coming. His cursing of the fig tree and saying no one will ever bear fruit, will ever eat fruit from you again. His story about the uh, vineyard keepers who would be judged and the kingdom would be given to somebody else. His parable about the wedding feast, about the king who made a marriage for his son and his friends were the first to be invited and did not show up. And uh, they refused to come in fact and he sent his armies and destroyed their city. His denunciation of the Pharisees where he said all the blood shed from Abel to Zechariah will come on this generation and not the least of which his prediction that not one stone of the temple would be standing on another, and that would happen in that generation. So, at the end of his ministry, Jesus was focused more on this latter part of Isaiah 61 2, the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus didn't start out his ministry with that focus. He was simply there to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, the acceptable year of the Lord, almost all commentators seem to agree that this is an allusion to the year of Jubilee. One reason for thinking so is because uh, the proclaim liberty to the captives, that line is verbally identical to a line in Leviticus 25, which actually is the law of the Jubilee. The word Jubilee comes from uh, Hebrew words meaning ram's horn. And it was called the Jubilee because it was announced every 50th year by the sounding of a ram's horn trumpet. And uh, it was a year it was the 50th year in every cycle of 50 that all prisoners were set free and debtors were released from their debts. And any kind of family properties that had had to be forfeit during that 50 year period or the 49 years previously because perhaps someone had, uh, had been financially broke and had to sell their ancestral property, it would return to the family in the 50th year. Uh, everything was sort of like hit the reset button. Every 50th year, it was like starting over, starting fresh. Had you gotten into prison? Had you become a slave? Had you gone into debt? Had you lost family property? Well, in the 50th year, the trumpet blows, and the reset button is, and you, you get a fresh start. You're, and that's what Jesus is proclaiming. There's a fresh start here. This is the spiritual jubilee. This is, in fact, no doubt, what the year of jubilee in the law was foreshadowing, was the salvation that Christ announces. Now, of course, the proclamation of liberty to captives, uh, that was not literal prison or literal captives that Jesus was proclaiming. He wasn't proclaiming uh, political justice and liberation. That, If that had been done, then he would have sprung John the Baptist out of prison. 
John the Baptist actually kind of wished that he would proclaim that kind of liberty in the opening of prison. Uh, he'd like to get out. But that was not what he was talking about. This is a spiritual salvation, a spiritual deliverance. But it was the acceptable year of the Lord. And he contrasts that in verse 2 with the day of vengeance of our God. And we've seen the day of vengeance first mentioned back in chapter 34. When it's talking about the judgment on Edom. And it says because uh, it's the day of God's vengeance. And now we see it again, the day of vengeance. And then in chapter 63, in chapter, verse 4, there's the day of vengeance in my heart and the year of my redeemed. Now notice in at least chapter 61, 2 and chapter 63, 4, the day of vengeance is linked with the year of salvation, the year of the redeemed, the year of the acceptable year of the Lord. A day is a short time, a year is a long time. And the day of uh, vengeance happened rather rapidly. It was the destruction of Jerusalem in a, sh in a war that lasted a few years. The year of Jubilee has lasted for 2,000 years. It's a longer period. Although God saves and judges, his primary activity is in saving. His judgment is dispensed with as quickly as possible. His salvation is enduring. So it's a year of salvation. It's a day of judgment. And this is the transition, of course from the old order to the new. In verse 2 he says, To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. As they've been mourning, sitting in the ashes, uh, they'll, they'll come out of their ashes and, and put on clothing, beautiful clothing. The oil of joy for mourning, they'll anoint themselves again uh, in celebration. That's how people did, people anointed themselves when they were fixing themselves up. And they, uh, they'd oil themselves. We wouldn't do that. We like the dry look in our culture. But in the Middle East, I guess they feel oily all the time. Anyway, they're always sweating there. So what's the matter? They pour more oil on and uh, look shiny. You know, slick your hair back and go to the party. You know, you, you anoint yourself for, to go to a feast or to go to a party or something in their culture. So the idea is that God is giving them uh, the attitude of rejoicing and celebration rather than of mourning because of course salvation has come. The garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So here we see we are trees that produce the fruit of righteousness, the, the fruit he's been looking for through the whole book of Isaiah. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Not just, this is not just talking about the Jews going back from Babylon and rebuilding Jerusalem and the Judean cities. This is raising up the ruins of many generations. The ruins which were rebuilt by the Jews returning from exile were just a couple generations back. But this is more, uh, this is more, as I was saying in the last lecture, a spiritual rebuilding, a recovery of lost spiritual virtues that have been lost generations earlier. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. We saw back in uh, the previous chapter, chapter 60, verse 10, the sons of foreigners shall build your walls. And uh, now the sons of foreigners are feeding your flocks and so forth. This simply means that Gentiles will be involved in God's work. Some will be shepherding flocks, like pastors do. Some will be building walls. Some will be tending vineyards, planting, and so forth. Spiritually, says, but you shall be named the priests of the Lord. And that is true in the New Testament. All of us are priests. In the Old Testament, that was not true. Um, in a sense, Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, but the priests of the Lord were essentially the sons of Aaron. But now all God's people are priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the servants of our God, a term that in the Old Testament usually referred to prophets. A, a servant of God was usually a prophet in the Old Testament uh, or a man of God. But we all should be priests and prophets in a sense. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, 
in their land they shall possess double everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make, them, uh, make with them an everlasting covenant. We've encountered this terminology many times previously. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. They'll be recognized as God's posterity or God's sons. Blessed of God. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. They will be recognized as God's posterity and they'll be blessed. Jesus said that in Matthew 5, 9. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So, God decks us with righteousness as a bride adorns herself. And in the book of Revelation, the bride is dressed in uh, white linen, pure and white. And uh, it says her linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So the bride is adorned with righteousness, the robe of righteousness. It is indeed righteous deeds that are mentioned in Revelation 19. And thus, not necessarily uh, as we might wish to say, well, it's, we're just clothed in imputed righteousness. Well, we are imputed righteous in Christ, but the bride is wearing a garment made of righteous deeds, if you read Revelation 19, around verses, what, 7 through 8 or so. Uh, as the earth brings forth its bud, and, its, and the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before the nations. Again, his fruit, righteousness, and in this case, praise. Uh, this, this statement may be what Jesus had in mind in Mark 4, in one of his parables. In Mark 4, 26 through 29, he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and he should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, it says the earth yields crops by itself. And he's talking about the fruit of the kingdom here. So also it says in Isaiah 61, 11, For as the earth brings forth its bud, and the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth. It's like they do, the, the garden does that itself. Man doesn't make that happen. Man puts the seed in, but... It's something else other than man makes it grow. Or as Paul put it when he's talking about himself and Apollos, uh, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gives the increase. The, the growing of the seed is God's doing. But this, this planting and the watering is ours to do. In chapter 62, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. We're not called Israel primarily, although that is, that is an identification we have. We're called by a new name. We're called by the name of Christ, Christians, which the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory. And in the hand of the Lord, uh, in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God, you shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land be more termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. The name Hephzibah actually means, uh, my delight is in her. And Beulah is a name that means married. So he says, I'm going to call you, my delight is in her, because the Lord delights in you. And your land will be called married, because your land should be married to God. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. It's strange that he doesn't stick with one uh, metaphor consistently. Uh, I mean, you'd think he'd say, well... God will marry you like a bride, and you'll marry God like a bridegroom. 
Instead, he talks about your sons shall marry you like a young man marries a virgin. I mean, that, it's like the connection is peculiar. However, it's very obvious what he's saying is God and his people will be married. That's the simple thing. It seems like it could be said simpler, but it's apparently the poetic way in which the prophet likes to express himself or God wishes for him to. He says, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. That's like verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. There are watchmen that God has set who are intercessors, apparently, and prophets. And Ezekiel is told that he is a, a watchman on the wall. Uh, Isaiah apparently sees himself as a watchman. Verse 6, God has set watchmen on the walls who give God no rest. That means they pray and they don't quit. And he says that he is one of those watchmen in verse 1. I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Those who are intercessors are crying out to God continually and, and ceaselessly until he has accomplished the ultimate purpose, which is that Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the church, will be filled with righteousness. And, uh, and the Gentiles, as it says in verse 2, shall see your righteousness and so forth. But the idea is the church has a glorious future and it, God has uh, put it on the hearts and put a call on some people to be spokesmen and prayer warriors to give God no rest and to beg him uh, to bring this about. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no longer give your grain to be food for your enemies, and the sons of the foreigner shall not drink your new wine, for which you have labored. But those who have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord. Those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the peoples. These are images mixed together that we've seen separately previously. The preparing the highway, obviously, is a common theme in, in the Messianic passages. And in chapter 40, Isaiah talks about John the Baptist preparing the highway for our God. So the highway began to be prepared when John the Baptist began to preach. The banner to the peoples is mentioned a number of times. Chapter 11, particularly, God will raise up a banner to the Gentiles and they'll come gather around. So this is talking about God gathering people to himself from all nations. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you should be called sought out and not forsaken. These are all terms, obviously, which uh, apply to us. Uh, we are the holy people. It says you, they should call them the holy people. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing to the saints or the holy people. The word saints means holy ones. The holy people in Rome. And he says that you are called saints. He said uh, in verse 7, Romans 1 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. There's, in our Bible, it says called to be saints, but to be is in italics, it's not in the Greek. It's just called saints. We are called holy ones. Saints means holy ones in the Greek. So, it says they should be called the holy people. That's what we are called. The redeemed of the Lord. We are called that too. Sought out. Well, what Jesus said, we were like sheep that the shepherd had sought out. We were going astray. And we are a city, the church is a city that has not been forsaken. A city on a hill that cannot be hid. In chapter 63, who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to say, is the answer. Why is your apparel red and your garment like one who treads in the winepress? The answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. 
And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drink in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. We've talked about this passage earlier. The uh, person seen is no doubt Jesus, or God, but I think Jesus is probably the person speaking. And he's coming from Edom. And his garments are dyed red, or sprinkled with red, because he's been trampling on somebody. You'd think it was Edom, because that's where he's coming from. Although Edom, the judgment of Edom can be seen, it, the complete judgment of Edom is correlated with the judgment of Jerusalem. Because, of course, the last Edomites, after Edom fell, uh, kind of were integrated into Israel. And the last known family of, Herod, uh, of Edomites were the Herod family. Herod the Great and his offspring were the last known Edomites. So they became, in a sense, part of Israel. So the ultimate judgment on Edom, final judgment of Edom, was uh, part, partook with the judgment of, of Israel in AD 70. And this is the day of vengeance in his heart. I also suggested the possibility, when we were talking about chapter 34, also the other place that talks about Edom and the day of vengeance, that it's possible that Edom is being used as a nickname for Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is often nicknamed, usually in an insulting way, by the names of pagan nations around them, including Sodom and others. In any case, I believe that what we're looking at is the same day of vengeance here as is mentioned in the other passages, chapter 34, verse 8, and chapter 61, verse 2, which I personally have reason to believe is the end of the old order, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of Judah by the Roman invaders. Verse 7, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitudes of his loving kindness. This apparently is referring to his mercies toward the remnant in bringing them into a new Zion in the Messiah. It says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. Now this is uh, actually going to recall the, the exodus and the early days of the natural Israel. Uh, so, uh, the, the statement about his goodness to Israel, I, I was uh, mistaken when I said this is the remnant because this is actually looking back at his goodness which they spurn, not the goodness which they will have in the end. Because he goes back and says, uh, he became their savior, he means from Egypt. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. The angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and the people, saying, Where is he who brought them up from the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them and led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep, as a horse in the wilderness that they might not stumble. As a beast goes down into the valley and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. So essentially, verses 7 through 14, Isaiah is wanting to mention the goodness of God and the unfaithfulness of Israel and saying, you know, God led them out of Egypt through Moses and was good to them. What happened to that? What happened to those, those days? Why did they rebel against that? And the rest of this chapter is a prayer, uh, basically, of repentance that Isaiah perhaps forms to put into the mouth of the remnant or of, the, of what Israel should be saying at this point. Look down from the heavens and see from your habitation, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your strength, the yearning of your heart and your mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless you are our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father. 
our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. Now, I believe this is a reference to the Gentiles. Their prayer, they're part of the remnant now too. Because Israel does not acknowledge us. And Abraham was ignorant of us. It's like this is not Abraham's natural seed that Abraham knew about. And in fact, Israel doesn't recognize us, but, but we are nonetheless your children. You're our father, and therefore Gentiles. You, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. O Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and hardened our heart from your fear? Return for your servants' sake the tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled, those who were never called by your name. Now, as far as who's speaking here, it does seem to ch shift a little bit. Because when he talks about the sanctuary has been trodden down, this is Jerusalem, of course, and the temple has been destroyed. And this is either talking as exiles in Babylon about the Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the temple, or this is, this is uh, perhaps describing the, the Jews who are alienated from God after the temple is destroyed in AD 70, but it's intermixed with references to people who do call God their father, who are Gentiles. It seems like we've got this, this intermixing that we often have of the judgment on the apostate Jews and the uh, salvation of those who are in Christ. In this case, focusing even on, on the Gentiles in verse 16. And it continues in, verse six, in chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. As if God manifested his righteousness from the heavens, if he came down in judgment, just like water makes, uh, I mean, fire makes water boil, the, the presence of God would make the nations tremble, like the the turbulence of, of the surface of water when it's boiling, it'd be not at peace. When you did awesome things which we did not look for, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. So, again, a confession of sin and the need for salvation for the people, probably Israel is in mind, that they are, they've wandered from God. He, their, their sanctuary has been trampled. He mentioned that, of course, in the previous chapter, verse 19, but it, it comes up again in this chapter, in verse 10, where he's going to say, your holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem is a desolation, our holy and beautiful temple, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. So he is talking about, apparently, the, the mourning of the Jews after the destruction of the temple, and depicting them as you know, suffering the consequences for all those sins that, uh, that were mentioned earlier. It says in verse 6, But we are like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there's no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold on you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Now, when he says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, no doubt you've heard this verse used or misquoted in a number of sermons. Usually it is quoted as all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, which is uh, usually preachers use that to suggest that you know, no matter how many good deeds you do, you're good, no matter how good you behave, your righteousness is actually uh, abominable to God. I've actually heard people say it's an insult to God to try to do good works. That, you know, that do, doing good works shows you don't trust in, you know, the finished work of Christ or something like that. 
And they, and they quote, you know, all of your righteousness, all the good deeds you do, it's, it's offensive to God. It's like filthy rags. Sometimes they say it's even like, like the word here means uh, used menstrual cloths, something filthy and unclean that the Jews would, uh, you know, be disgusted by. And it's used like, you know, we're not clothed in the robes of righteousness, we're clothed in filthy rags, and uh, all of our righteousness can't rise above that. But that's not really true. And that's not what it says. I mean, John the Baptist's parents, they were righteous people in their behavior. They, uh, their righteousness was not like filthy rags. In Luke chapter 1, we read about John the Baptist's parents, Luke 1, 6, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. This is not describing a condition that they should be ashamed of or that God is disgusted by. This is the way God commanded Israel to live. If you look at Acts chapter 10, there's a description of Cornelius, a Gentile who didn't even know God. But he was seeking God. And it says of him in verse 2, Acts 10, 2, he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, was this considered filthy rags by God? No, an angel appeared to him. And said in verse 4, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. That is, God is noticing with favor your alms and your prayers. And so, here's a man who didn't even know God. His righteous deeds were certainly not filthy rags. So what does Isaiah mean? He doesn't say all our righteousness. He says all our righteousnesses. He's talking about certain particular actions which the Jews were doing as their religious duty, probably the sacrifices, probably the incense they were burning, probably the fasting that we've encountered already in earlier chapters where God's not disgusted by these things. You're doing all these actions as if you're a righteous people. You're doing religious works. Those are our righteousnesses that Isaiah said. Religious works that are not really accompanied with Righteous life. In other words, trusting in ritual things instead of in real righteousness. Thinking that offering a sacrifice, fasting, uh, keeping the ritual, that that's something that makes me righteous. All those deeds of righteousness, those righteousnesses, these people, their deeds are like filthy rags. This is similar to when Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh... You know, we, we sometimes apply that to all people. You know, your heart is desperately wicked. But the Bible doesn't say all people's hearts are desperately wicked. Jeremiah is talking about the people of Jerusalem of his time. He's, he's describing the state of the apostate nation. Their hearts only evil continually. And um, so what, what many times theologians have done, they take prophetic denunciation that the prophets used to denounce their generation of hypocritical Jews. Jews who were keeping the outward forms of religion, but inwardly were corrupt, uh, doing evil things. They were not sincere. And they talk about how their righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God, or how their hearts are desperately wicked. And theologians take those and they just kind of make that a blanket statement about all people. And then they form a doctrine of, uh, you know, total depravity, which the prophets never had any intention of, of saying. Jeremiah wasn't saying that his heart was desperately wicked. Isaiah's heart wasn't desperately wicked. There, were, there was always a remnant of whom these things were not true. But they were true of that generation, of that people, and maybe of many others besides. I'm not suggesting that the Jews of that time were the only people who could be described that way. It's just that even if this description fits many people of many times, it doesn't fit all people necessarily. It didn't fit John the Baptist's parents. It didn't fit Cornelius. And there's no reason to believe it fits most people uh, who might be just ordinary people who are, you know, they got sin. Of course, we're all sinners. That's not the same thing as saying that all of our thoughts are always evil continually. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there is a, you know, Reformed theology basically almost depends on the suggestion that an unsaved person is always continually sold under wickedness. And even when they do good things, they're hypocritical. 
Even when they do good things, God is disgusted by the good works they do because they're not regenerated. And so from this doctrine comes the idea that you can't be regenerated. You can't believe unless God regenerates you. You can't repent. None of these things are stated in Scripture. The Bible never says that you have to be regenerated to repent. It says you have to repent to be regenerated. It never says you have to be regenerated to believe. It says you have to believe to be born again. That's regenerate. You, you become regenerated by believing. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again, he said, how? How can this be? And Jesus said, it's like Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness. People looked at it and were healed. So I'm here. Whoever believes in me will be born again. We'll have eternal life. That's how. That's how you get regenerated, by believing. Everywhere in Scripture, John said, these things I write to you so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life. That is, by believing, you obtain eternal life, but you become regenerated. So, anyway, I, I'm on this because this particular verse in Isaiah and similar verses in some of the Old Testament passages have been quite wrenched from their context by popular theology in order to make a point that the Bible doesn't make and doesn't intend to make. In fact, the Bible contradicts this theology. And so... Isaiah is complaining that his people, his generation, though they are religious, all their religious actions are disgusting to God because, of course, he said earlier, they're, they're unjust in their dealings. They're not living a righteous life. They're doing righteousnesses, individual acts of religiosity. They're not righteous people. They're not living a righteous life. Uh, their life is not described by righteous patterns of living. But verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay... And you are potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Now this statement that Israel is the clay and God is the potter, Paul picks up on this in Romans 9. And he points out that God, as the potter, has the right to take the lump of clay, one lump, Israel, and make two vessels. That's what Paul says in Romans 9. He says, does not the potter have the right over the clay to make of the same lump two vessels? One for honor, one for dishonor. What he's saying is that he's basing it on this verse and on one similar in Jeremiah chapter 18 where God's being the potter and, and Israel the clay is in both places. He's saying there's one lump of clay. That's the nation of Israel. God is the potter and he can make two vessels. He's made one vessel for honor. That's the remnant. And he's made one vessel for dishonor. That's the apostate. All of Israel divides into two parts. They're either in one vessel or the other. They both came from the same lump of clay, but the vessels are different. The vessel that's honorable and used for honorable uses is the faithful remnant in Israel. The vessel that is not honorable is the, is the uh, apostate in Israel. And so in Romans 9, of course, what Paul is pointing out is that God has the right to make that kind of distinction if he wants to. He did that even in the womb of Rebekah when Jacob and Esau were in there. He, he decided which of Abraham's seed would carry on the promises. He chose Jacob for that, not Esau. Some people make the mistake of thinking it's talking about choosing someone to be saved and someone to be lost. But Paul doesn't make any reference to Esau being lost or Jacob being saved. He talks about God is choosing in Abraham's family who will be the, the, the children of promise and who will not be. Jacob was chosen for that. Esau was not. And Paul says, he quotes the Old Testament from Genesis 25. He says, as it is said, the older shall serve the younger. In other words, Esau would serve Jacob. Obviously, there's no reference to salvation here. People in hell aren't serving people in heaven, are they? No. Jacob would be the superior brother. He would be the brother that would have the birthright. Esau would not have the birthright. This is talking about natural inheritance here. This is talking about which of Abraham's seed would bring forth the promises made to Abraham in the earth. That is, would bring forth the Messiah. Jacob was chosen for that. That's a privilege. Esau was not chosen for that. God made a sovereign choice. He didn't base it on any good thing they did or bad, good or bad. It has nothing to do with a prediction about salvation. It's saying that in Abraham's family, Israel, God has always been making choices of who would be the promised seed and who would not be the promised seed. And Israel's like a lump of clay and God has taken that nation and made two categories, two vessels. The believers in it are the chosen seed, as it were, the, the, the uh, children of the promise. And the others, who are the apostates, are not. 
And so Isaiah is seeing this too. God has the right to make this distinction. He says, don't be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look. We all are your people. And by that, he must mean the remnant, because clearly not all the apostate were his people, and he's made that very clear. Your holy cities are wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem is a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us? So, essentially, this is bemoaning the judgment that comes on the apostate. And, of course, acknowledging that God has the right, as the potter, to do what he wants to with it. But uh, one thing he had done is destroyed the, the apostate and the temple. But, of course, as Paul said in Romans 11, there are Jews who have been cut off the tree because of unbelief, but they can be added back if they do not remain in unbelief, Paul said. Now, Paul didn't predict that they will be added back. He simply said that just as they were cut off for unbelief, they can be grafted back in, just like we Gentiles have been. And this is a very big if, of course, but it is something, it is a condition that has been met by uh, many. It says in uh, Romans 11, 23, talking about the Jews who have, who have been come under judgment. They are cut off the tree. It says... And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, as you Gentiles, how much more will these, that is the unbelieving Jews, if they, as he said, if they don't continue in unbelief, how much more will they, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So, God is certainly able to graft them back in. He can graft a natural branch in as easily or maybe more easily than, than a foreign branch. The point is here, though, though Israel has come under judgment, it is possible for them to be saved. It is possible for them to turn to Christ like anybody else. It's not like God has cut off Israel as a whole as a race. God's not a racist. He doesn't favor Israel for their race or despise them for their race. He favors those who favor him. He honors those who honor him and despises those who, who despise him. And so Israel was judged because basically they were despising him. But if they turn, if they don't remain in unbelief, they too can be saved. Chapter 65, God says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that was not called by my name. This is a reference to the Gentiles who in former times, before the time of Christ, didn't seek Yahweh. They, they worshipped other gods. They didn't ask for Yahweh to send the gospel to them. He came to them. He sent messengers to them. They didn't ask for him. They were a nation that had not been called by his name. Now, I know that this is talking about the Gentiles because Paul quotes this in Romans 10.20. And he makes that point from this very verse. In Romans 10, 20, it says, But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask me. Verse 21, But to Israel, he says, All day long I stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. That's the next verse in Isaiah 65. Paul quotes the first two verses of Isaiah 65. He applies the first one to the Gentiles and the second one to Israel. So, the nation and the people who didn't seek God previously were, of course, the Gentiles. They were, not, they were not his people. But, with reference to Israel, Paul says, God's words in verse 2 of Isaiah 65 are, I have stretched out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good. Now, Paul's quotation and application of these verses justify what I've been saying. That In one verse, he's talking about the remnant. The next verse, he's talking about the, 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 the rebels. The next verse he's talking about the remnant again. He kind of bounces back and forth. He does so in these two consecutive verses. Paul says in the first of these verses, he's talking about the church, the Gentiles, the, the faithful. In the second, he's talking about the rebellious Jews. So Isaiah kind of bounces back and forth like a ping pong ball between these two groups. 
a rebellious people who walk in the way that is not good according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick. This would be in the high places to the pagan gods. Who sit among the graves and spend the night in the tombs. Man of the tombs comes to mind because he's demon possessed. But here it's talking about people who conduct their religious pagan rites in the graves, in the graveyard. It says, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels. They're eating unclean foods that the Jews are not allowed to eat. Who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than thou. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Clearly a reference to the Pharisees and people like them who were anything but righteous in their, in their real heart of hearts. They were full of dead men's bones and foul things, Jesus said, full of uncleanness. Outwardly they were whitewashed sepulchers, but outwardly they were saying, I'm holier than you. But they stink to God. It's like smoke in his nostrils. It's irritating to him, this kind of religious shallowness and hypocrisy. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but I will repay, even repay into their bosom your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord. Now Jesus said that his generation would repay the price of the bloodshed of all their ancestors. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, he said, all the prophets that your fathers killed. He said, you're going to fill up the measure of your father's guilt. Thank you. And he's going, and, uh, and you're going to, he said, all this is going to come on this generation. Of course, he's talking about A.D. 70. So must this be when it says, I'm going to repay into their bosom the iniquities of, and the iniquities of their fathers together all at once. That generation, says the Lord, who have burned incense on the mountains and blasphemed me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. Now, some might say, but the Jews in the, in the first century weren't offering incense and sacrifices to pagan idols. After the Babylonian captivity, they didn't do that anymore. True. But whenever Isaiah describes the true worship of the true God of the remnant in Isaiah, he uses figures reminiscent of the old order. He talks about offering incense. He talks about offering sacrifices on the altar. He talks about things that were the characteristics of worship in his day, just like he mentions nations in his day to represent Gentiles in general. He mentions the worship forms of his day to represent worship in general. He also mentions the apostasy of his day and its forms of high places to represent apostasy in general. This is how Isaiah works. This is how the prophets in general are. They, they will use things that are forms of their own time to represent things that actually take a different form in the New Testament age. Circumcision, for example. Sabbath, for example. Uh, you know, the, the Enoch, the, the, the uh, sons of the foreigners and the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths will have a place in my house like sons and daughters. Uh, well, that sounds like literal Sabbath keeping. And he also says, and your sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. But he's talking about the New Testament era. What's this Sabbaths and sacrifices on the altar? It's typical. Typical of how the prophets speak about the New Testament order. It's talking about true, true worship of God, which Jesus said is in spirit and in truth, but using the imagery that the Jews understood to be what worship is like. Of course, it takes a different form when it's spiritual. But likewise, the apostasy of the people of Jesus' day is described in terms of the apostasy of the people of Isaiah's day. And remember, Jesus said... Well did Isaiah speak of you people, what he said, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Well, Isaiah wasn't talking about Jesus' generation, he was talking about his own generation. But Jesus said he was talking about you people. That is, you people are the same as the people in Isaiah's day. The forms of their disobedience were not the same, but they were the same, God had the same issues with them. That they were religious externally, they were holier than thou, they were a stench in his nostrils, and uh, they, and yet they, you know, they they were all externalistic in their religion, but they were apostate. Now we find that Isaiah here is going to bounce back and forth. Verses eight through ten are about the remnant. Verses eleven through fifteen are about the apostate. 
verse 16 and following, about the new order and the Messiah. So we're, again, bouncing back and forth between the good and the bad here. But you'll see that the language calls to mind the present age of the Messiah and the judgment that came on Jerusalem after Jesus arrived. Thus says the Lord, verse 8, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and Ju from Judah, an heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it. My servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold for flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. So they're like the gleanings of the grapes. There's a, a remnant that are left behind uh, that is spared from the judgment and uh, who are, in this case, um, you know, the Christians. And then he says, but you are those who forsake the Lord, verse 11, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad. Now Gad is a name of one of the tribes of Israel, but it, the word Gad actually means number, or, excuse me, or troop, or fortune. It could be you prepare a table for a fortune, or, or some people say that's a false god, fortune. Others say it's for a troop. Now you have so many false gods, you can call them a troop of gods you're, you're serving. Who furnish a, a drink offering for meanie. Now meanie is a term you find in Daniel, chapter 5, it's in the writing on the wall. It means number. So it may be that gad means a troop, because many means a number. You're worshiping lots of gods, a troop of gods, many of them, a, a number of them. Therefore, I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but you did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. This, this verse, uh, the latter part of verse 12, is a refrain that comes up again in chapter 66 and verse 4. God called, they didn't answer. They chose what he didn't delight in. Doesn't sound like God's doing all the choosing here. God's calling them and they don't come. Jesus said, how, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered you as a, your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. God's calling and they're not coming. There is free will here. They choose that which he has no delight in them choosing. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and with grief of spirit. That is, the remnant, the Christians, will be fed. Their thirst will be quenched. They will rejoice instead of mourn. These are what the Beatitudes say. In uh, Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 20, Jesus said, Blessed are you poor, blessed are you who mourn or weep. Blessed are you who are hungry, you shall be fed. But then he says, But woe to you who laugh, you'll mourn. Woe to you who are full, you'll be hungry. And so Jesus actually makes this distinction too in Israel. There are God's servants who will be fed, and there will be God's enemies in Israel who will go hungry. God will bless, in other words, those who are his servants in Israel, but judge the others. Verse 15, you shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord will slay you and call his servants by another name. So this is the destruction of Jerusalem and calling his servants by the name of Christ, of course. And the name Jew is left more or less as a curse. Now, this is not an anti-Semitic statement. When it says, I'll leave your name as a curse, when people cursed... They would say, may you be like so-and-so, meaning something bad, you know. May you be like Korah that the earth opened up and swallowed. It would be a typical kind of a curse. And now the name Jew is going to be used. That. May you be like the Jews. It's not, it's not basically as a racial statement. It's basically saying what happened to them is so disastrous that if you want to curse somebody, you wish such things upon them. May you be like the Jews. Now this is, you know, in our day of uh, 
being careful not to sound anti-Semitic, it's almost hard to even uh, give this example, but I believe that this is what is being said here. He said, I will slay you, the Lord will slay you, and call his servants by another name, not your name. Israel, natural Israel is not the name of his servants anymore, it's Christians, it's the body of Christ, it's, they're called by the name of Christ. So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God, not the God of Israel, as in the Old Testament, but the God of truth. He who swears in the earth shall swear by not the God of Israel or the God of Jacob, but the God of truth. Jesus is the truth. The, the God of Jesus Christ is the God that is now recognized in oaths and so forth, is the example he gives. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. Now here we have in verse 17 the first mention of the new heavens and new earth. They'll be mentioned again at the end of chapter 66. But well, what is the new heavens, new earth? In the New Testament, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, it says we look for a new heavens and new earth. Peter said that the present heavens and earth are being kept in store for our day of judgment, fiery judgment, in which the heavens will be dissolved, the earth will be burned up, the elements will melt with fervent heat, but we look for a new heavens, new earth, according to his promise, in which dwell righteousness. Peter is talking apparently about eschatology, about the end times, about Jesus coming back and establishing the new order, the heavens and earth. In Revelation 21 and 22, John sees a new heavens and a new earth, and he sees a new Jerusalem descending out of heaven to the new earth, which he describes in terms reminiscent of Isaiah 60. Um, so in the New Testament, it would appear... And it is my conviction at this present time in my life that the, the new Jerusalem and the new heavens new earth described in Revelation refer to a future glory of the church. We are the new Jerusalem now, but in Revelation chapter 21, John sees the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for her husband, having made herself ready and having the glory of God. I believe the church has yet to be glorified. The church has God but we are not yet glorified, and I believe that that's an eschatological thing that John sees. I think it's an eschatological thing that Peter talks about. That Some people think that's just a reference to the church at the present time. Now, the language of new heavens and new earth originates here in Isaiah. Verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. The former shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. So, given the information in the New Testament, we might assume that this description is going to be of the eschatological new world, and that's how most commentators take it. However, it is, in many respects, very much a kingdom passage, like others in Isaiah, which the New Testament primarily applies to our own age. Now, here we have a bit of a conflict. Isaiah's passages about the kingdom are almost always, the New Testament writers apply them to now, to the church age. However, it would appear that Peter and John, John in Revelation and Peter in 2 Peter, apply the new heavens and earth to a future eschatological age. I have, uh, I have no room for dogmatism about this, but my own understanding is that there is going to be a, a literal new heavens and new earth when Jesus comes back, as Peter and John seem to be talking about. But I also believe that the new heavens and new earth have broken into the present era. Because Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The creation of the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1 is, a, is uh, replaced with a new creation, a new heavens, new earth in Isaiah. But if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. We've already part we already participated. He says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, Paul said. Likewise, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says that Christians are those who have tasted of the powers of the world to come or the age to come. And therefore, my thought is that there is a world to come, a new heavens, new earth to be seen when Jesus returns. However, the powers of that age are already experienced by those of us who are in Christ, a new creation. See, Christ has already come into the new creation in his resurrection. He's already been glorified. In him, we are glorified also. The time will come when our bodies are glorified in resurrection. There's a spiritual and there's a, and there's a physical. 
And so in my understanding, Isaiah here, and to the end of the book, is still talking about the present age, the present experience of this new creation. But it may have an echo in the eschatological new creation too. But I'm convinced that when we get to chapter uh, 66, which still talks about the new heavens and new earth, we're looking at the first century, the remnant uh, glorifying God and the judgment upon the wicked. But this is very different than what many commentators say. So you'll just have to make up your own mind, frankly. But in chapter 65, verse 17, Behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, that's a new Jerusalem, as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. These, this information is very much like the information about the kingdom age in all the other passages, or many of the other passages we've read, which are identified as fulfilled today in our lives. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Now this verse has been really uh, a source of perplexity to many people. Uh, generally, premillennialists believe that this is describing the millennium. In fact, uh, in the Schofield Reference Bible, which inserts Schofield's own subtitles, over verse 17 it says, the new heavens and the new earth. But over verse 18 it says, the millennial kingdom. In other words, verse 17 says, behold, I make a new heavens and new earth. Well, Schofield and other premillennials do not equate that with the millennium. But Schofield then says, ah, but when you turn to verse 18, it's the millennium. There's certainly no signal from Isaiah about that, and I don't see any reason to believe it. I believe that we're talking about whatever it is that he's calling the new heavens and new earth all the way through here. But what's this about babies dying at 100 years old? And, you know, this is a very difficult passage. It's difficult, actually, for anyone because the language is so strange. So the premillennials say if someone dies in the millennium at 100 years old, they'll still be a baby. And the impression is that it's saying something a little like that, that, it, that people live so long that the first 100 years is still infancy. If someone died at 100 years old, it's, like, it's almost like being stillborn. It's almost like being died at infancy. A, a they're still a child, still a baby. Uh, but the language is hard to unravel. I've uh, worked on it a lot over the years and have not been able to come up with anything very satisfying, except to say I think this is a poetic way of talking about a new kind of life that is eternal. Uh, not necessarily talking about literal death, or literal babies, or literal hundreds of years, but it's impressionistic. The idea is this is the age of eternal life. Those who are in the New Jerusalem have eternal life, which the Bible says we have now. Jesus said, he that hears my words and believes in him who sent me shall, has eternal life and shall not come into condemnation because he's passed from death into life in John 5, 24. So we have eternal life. We've passed from death into life. This life is eternal. I don't believe that there's any literalness to babies dying at 100 years old. I think that, again, it's impressionistic. The idea is these people live a really long time. This is not natural. This is not natural life. This is like supernatural, long life. And as such, I personally believe this is just a reference to eternal life stated in some really weird uh, imagery. If somebody thinks otherwise, they're welcome to think so. Verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring uh, with them. Now this is obviously cast in, in terms that the Jews could really appreciate. They've been invaded, their house has been torn down, 
their children are born to troublesome times. That's been Jewish history for the most part. It says, well, it's, it's all the opposite of that. You know, you'll live in your own house. No one else is going to live in your house. Your children are, are going to be born to a peaceable situation, as everyone would wish. This is all, I believe, impressionistic of the blessings of the new covenant. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. This imagery was, of course, found first in Isaiah chapter 11, a passage which in its entirety uh, seems to be about the present age, as it is so frequently, uh, so many images in it are quoted in the New Testament and applied to the present age. Um, one thing interesting here is that though there seem to be um, enemies, former enemies reconciled, Jews and Gentiles, like wild beasts and domesticated beasts, there's reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles, but not between them and the devil. The serpent's still eating dust. He's not recovered. He's not, nothing has improved for him. Uh, although in chapter 11, when it talks about this, it says a child shall play at the serpent's hole and will not be harmed by it. The serpent is not, has not uh, been restored, but his power over the people of God has been reduced. We're at the end of the book. We're going to take chapter 66 very rapidly. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Now, Stephen quoted this first verse in his sermon. Remember, he was accused, before he was brought to trial, he was accused of saying that Jesus would come, change all the ordinances that Moses had brought, and destroy the temple, or destroy this place, Jerusalem, and the temple. That's what he was accused of. And he gave a sermon in his own defense that basically the temple isn't that sacrosanct. And it's, he shouldn't be on trial for his life because he predicted that the temple is going to be destroyed. After all, God said, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Who cares about any earthly house? Stephen said God never even asked to have the temple built. In Stephen's sermon, he says God commanded Moses to build the tabernacle, but David is the one who built him a house. And that was not something that God came to David about and asked for. It was David's idea. God blessed it, but it was David's idea. And God says, what house do you put me in? Solomon, the one who actually built the temple, when he prayed and dedicated the temple, he said, Lord, what, what house can I build for you? Heaven, even the heavens cannot contain you. Even Solomon, the builder of the temple, knew that God doesn't really, he's not confined to the temple. The temple's not that sacrosanct. And that's what Stephen was saying. And of course, this is in the context where God's going to destroy the temple in AD 70, but he's going to preserve the remnant. He's not going to live in a temple made with hands. He's going to live with the people who are poor of a contrite spirit, who tremble at his word. That's who he's going to be with. This is an echo, uh, not verbatim, but very similar to what he said in Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, 15. God said, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, but with him also who has a contrite and humble spirit. So God dwells in heaven, in the high and lofty place, but he also dwells in the lowest places, in the hearts of the lowly people who are broken and contrite and humble. And so he says, this house that you built for me, I'm moving out. I'm going to dwell with the people who are humble, who tremble at my word, not the apostate Jews who have my word but don't fear me. And Jesus said at the end of his ministry, your house is left to you desolate. Earlier in his ministry, he had said to the Jews, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. The temple is his father's house. At the end of his ministry, it's not in his father's house. This is your house. Your house is left to you desolate, he said to the Jews. You, it's yours now. It's not God's. He's moved out. God is moving into a new temple, the body of Christ, made up of those who are poor and of contrite spirit, who tremble his word. Now, here's a description of the apostates in verses 3 and 4. It echoes some of the language from chapter 4. 65 verse 12, he who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. 
He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. In other words, they are actually offering incense in the way that Moses prescribed, but their hearts are so wrong, they might as well be offering a dog or a swine or an unclean animal because that's, God accepts it just as much. They are really offering lambs and bulls, as God said to, but they might as well be offering human sacrifices and pigs and dogs. That's what he's saying. That's how unacceptable their worship is. That's why he's destroying the temple. It has become a place which is an abomination to him. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. And of course, the main contrast here is they chose their own ways, so I, Lord, the Lord, will choose their delusions. You choose to be a follower of Christ or not, he'll choose the outcome. If you choose to be a follower of Christ, he'll choose a glorious outcome. If you choose to be against him, like they did, then he'll choose their delusions and the judgment. Verse 5, hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, those who are the remnant, who are mentioned in verse 2. Your brethren who hated you, who cast out you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. It's interesting, this has almost a, an exact... Uh, fulfillment in John chapter 9 where the blind beggar whom Jesus healed was taken before the chief priests and gave his testimony and they, they wanted him to change his testimony and they said let God be glorified uh, and, and here he says those are your brethren who cast you out notice in John 9 after this man did not cave in on his testimony they cast him out and it says in John 9 when Jesus knew they'd cast him out he looked him up here, your brethren who cast you out said, let the Lord be glorified. This is, the blind man, no doubt, is sort of an emblem of all the remnant who are cast out by sanctimonious Jewish authorities who think that they're glorifying God, but they are, like Jesus said, the time will come when men will kill you and think they're doing God a favor. Now, they're not, they don't know God. The sound of noise from the city, that'd be, of course, the the disaster coming on Jerusalem. A voice from the temple. The voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. Before she travailed, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. As before God destroyed Jerusalem, he brought forth the seed of Abraham, the male child that we read of in Revelation chapter 12. The pregnant woman in travail brings forth a male child who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But this happened before Jerusalem fell, before she travailed. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she gave birth to her children. When the judgments came on Jerusalem, the remnant escaped, left Jerusalem, went across the river to Pella, and her children survived her. She gave birth to the church, as it were, in connection with her travail. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, who cause delivery, shut the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. So the new Jerusalem is born out of the travail of the old Jerusalem. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like the flowing stream. Then you will feed on her sides, and you shall be carried and dandled on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So the children of the new Jerusalem will be comforted by God. Uh, in the loss of the mother city, Jerusalem. They're comforted by being in the new Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. Now, verses 15 through 17 talk about this judgment on the apostate Jerusalem. For behold, the Lord will come with fire 
and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and abomination and the mouse. They even ate mice, apparently, an unclean animal. They shall be consumed together, says the Lord. So the, the apostate Jews in Jerusalem uh, who are you know, just defiling their worship of God, they'll be consumed and the slain of the Lord will be many. Verse 18, now the Gentiles will glorify God. That's the upshot of, of course, the destruction of Jerusalem. The Gentiles come in in great numbers. And I says, I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, like the banner that he spoke of earlier, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations. So the remnant of the Jews, the Jewish disciples, who escaped the fall of Jerusalem, Jesus sent them to go and disciple all nations. And so I mean, this is literally fulfilled. Then it gives the name of a lot of ancient nations, Tarshish and Pol and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, and the coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, the gospel preached in all the Gentile world. And they shall see, they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all the nations, on horses and in chariots, and in litters and mules and camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, which is of course earlier in earlier prophecies, it's the church, says the Lord. As the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take some of them, that is the Gentiles that they bring in, for priests and Levites, because the church is has become a kingdom of priests, even though we were not even Jewish, much less of the sons of Aaron, yet Gentiles are now the priesthood. Well, not all, not all Gentiles, but the Gentiles who actually come to Christ. In Romans chapter uh, 15, In verse 16, Paul alludes to this verse in talking about his own ministry among the Gentiles. He says, at the end of verse 15 of Romans 15, he says, Because of the grace of God given to me by God, that I might become a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering to the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul said that his evangelization of the Gentiles was offering an offering to God. The Gentiles are the offering that he's offering to God. In Isaiah 66, 20, it says that they shall bring to the Lord out of all nations on horses and so forth uh, these Gentiles as an offering to the Lord. So Paul's referring to this as what his ministry is doing. He's applying this to his own time, of course. Verse 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. So in the new, in the new order, you don't worship on the new moons only or on the Sabbaths only. You do it between those times too. From one new moon to another. New moon was the first day of each month. So all month long. From, one, from the new moon of January to the new moon of February, and all the, you know, in between, they come and worship God. From one Sabbath to the next. Some uh, Seventh-day Adventists have used this verse to say that this is talking about how we're supposed to be worshiping on the Sabbath, but it actually doesn't say that. It says from one Sabbath to the next, from one new moon to the next. It means all the, the whole period of time in between them. People will be worshiping God, and that's, of course, what is true. In the New Covenant, we worship God all the time. We don't just have a few holy days that we do that on. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men whom have, who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, of course, this is a standard proof text about hell, but it's hard to know why it would be applied to hell. It doesn't say it's hell. Uh, it talks about corpses burning. There are dead people, and their corpses are burning perpetually. Now, the language of you know fire that's not quenched, we've had that language in Isaiah. We'll have it in Jeremiah also. 
The fire that does not quench is God's uh, anger that cannot be resisted by human force. Men can't quench it. A fire that no one can quench is how it's sometimes put. It's, it's a fire that is not quenched by man. It is God's judgment. Their worm does not die, I believe is just imagery. Uh, their, their corpses are continually rotting. But the point here is the, the redeemed go out and see it. They worship before the Lord and they walk out and they see all these corpses out here rotting. I don't think that we're going to do that in heaven. I don't think we're going to go out and go take tours of hell and watch the corpses molder and burn. I, this, is, uh, this is figurative language, obviously. But it is, in my understanding, a reference to the fact that the remnant will be worshiping God all the time, but the, uh, those who rebelled against him, as he refers to it, those who have transgressed against him, uh, the Jews that were you know, killed in Jerusalem, they are thrown into Gehenna. They're thrown into the Valley of Hinnom. Their corpses are there, being burned. Jeremiah said the same thing. He said the Valley of Hinnom would become the Valley of Slaughter because of the multitude of corpses that would be thrown into it in Jeremiah chapter 7. And uh, Jesus actually quoted these words from Isaiah 66, 24, three times in a, in a preaching he gave in Mark chapter 9. And he referred to this as Gehenna. Now, Isaiah doesn't say it's Gehenna. Isaiah does, it just says they're out there, you know, the worms are eating them and the, and the, uh, the fires are burning them. But he doesn't, uh, Isaiah doesn't call it the Valley of Hinnom. Jesus is the one who does that. In Mark chapter 9, it says in verse 43, If your hand makes you sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than to having two hands to go to Gehenna into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He refers to that as Gehenna in the Greek, which means the Valley of Hinnom. So he's saying that Isaiah is describing Gehenna. Now, of course, traditionally, in the English Bible, Gehenna is translated as hell. But a real translation of the word would be Valley of Hinnom. Hell is not a translation, but an interpretation of Gehenna. The translation is Valley of Hinnom. They should go be thrown into the valley of Hinnom. And that is where the corpses of the slain are thrown when Jerusalem is destroyed. It's right outside the city. And so I believe that Isaiah closes, as he, as he did many of his prophecies earlier in the book, with the idea that there's a judgment on the old order, and those that were loyal to it and rebelled against God, uh, they are suffering. And they are judged in a permanent way. And particularly the people who were killed in the fall of Jerusalem are perhaps in view here. But that there would be nonetheless a spiritual Zion that continues on after the fall of the old Jerusalem. And that is the message of Isaiah, especially in the later portion of the book. A new Jerusalem and the fall of the old Jerusalem.